This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development from a group of guys with many things in common, but one for today. We all love Drupal. We record this live on Wednesday afternoons at a Google Hangout. Visit us at TalkingDrupal.com. This is episode 88. It's Wednesday, March 4th, 2015. We're going to talk about load testing. Welcome, guys. What's going on? Hello. And John, I'll I'll save. I'm gonna use my joke right now. And when we say load testing, we're not talking about John testing. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, I couldn't resist. I could I couldn't resist. Sorry. I don't even really know what that means, but okay. okay. All right. So welcome, John Picozzi from Oomph. How are you, John? Uh, I'm fabulous. Um, we actually uh, at Oomph moved into our new offices this week, and they are fabulous. Um, if you're in the Providence area, and obviously you're listening to podcasts, so you're probably into Drupal, um, next month we'll be hosting the uh, Drupal PVD meetup. Um, so if you want to check out the new offices, uh, come on by to that event, um, second Tuesday in April. Uh, we'll be hosting that. So I am so happy we're getting out of a sort of a general space like we've been in and can move this this uh, this uh, meeting to a company office. I think that's awesome. You know, I, that happens a lot in Boston. There's companies that will host uh, a Drupal meetup in their space, and it really works out well. So uh, I appreciate Oomph doing that, and John, thank you for initiating that and making it happen. And we also have, as usual, Nick Laughlin from Enlightened Design. Good afternoon. How you guys doing? Load testing is... Definitely an interesting topic. It's one of those things where you, when you first get started out, you usually don't pay attention to it much, but as sites get bigger and more complex, it, it becomes part of the workflow. So definitely interested to hear how other people handle this. And uh, sounds like Rob really knows what he's talking about in this space too. Yeah, so we're, we're happy to have another Oomph employee with us today. Um, Rob is the r Director of Engineering and Oomph. Um, he has been doing web development. Um, I'm not sure all in Drupal, but for over 15 years. He works on projects of all sizes, from small businesses to Fortune 100 companies, nonprofits. Um, and when he's not coding, he's doing things like brewing beer, roasting coffee, biking, uh, and playing with his dog Hurley. So I'm also interested to learn all those things <laughs> from Rob. Welcome, Rob. Hey guys, thanks for having me on today. Definitely excited to talk about this topic. It's uh, pretty challenging stuff, um, for sure. So. so why don't we start by talking about what do we mean by load testing? What, is, what does that mean? Because um, there's probably a lot of listeners that have never done it before. Um, and it, it, it's probably in the future at some point. Um, and it's, it's at that point where... You're working with a customer um, or a website that they're expecting some traffic that might be beyond what we would call normal traffic. Um, so, what is load testing exactly? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I think I think with load testing, um, you know, the biggest thing is you you don't know until you launch a site exactly how it's going to perform perform typically um, with your your expected traffic. So whether it be a brand new site that you're launching for the first time or a site that you are uh, kind of redesigning, uh, maybe you're moving or migrating your site to a new server or a new hosting environment. Um, and, you know, you don't want to go into that blindly. You want to have a really good understanding of how your, your new site uh, is going to perform on the new platform or the new hosting environment um, before you flip the switch on it, right? You don't want to go, go live on day one and get the usual traffic or get a spike in traffic due to some marketing efforts. Um, and you know you run into a problem. Your site goes down, or the performance is so bad that uh, people are having a really bad experience on your site. So um, you know that's the typical use case for load testing. You need to get ahead of that and, and try and get a really good understanding of how your site is going to operate. Um, you know when you're when you're going to go live and have real people heading it. Hey Rob, do, I I expect that you guys over to Oomph don't load test all of the websites you launch. Uh, so what is the threshold that you guys decide that you need to do it? 
Um, I, I don't know whether we have a specific threshold. Um, typically, we'll, what will happen is, depending on the, the size of the project, um, what we know to be the expected traffic or the exposure for that site, um, you know, it, it's something that we'll discuss with a client, uh, you know, during the early phases of the project and present them with that option. Um, they, you know, kind of have the final say. They may or may not want to want to have us do load testing for them. Um, they might feel confident that, you know, hey, we're doing this redesign. We're going to do uh, what you know somebody might call a soft launch, where, uh, you know, they're not necessarily announcing it for day one. They want to kind of, you know, flip the switch, launch the site, and have uh, a typical uh, traffic uh, on that site, and then do a marketing effort, you know, the week after or whatever. Um, and they may decide that they don't need to have load testing. In other cases, they may know that they're getting a ton of traffic. Um, everybody's kind of waiting or anticipating that, that site launch, um, and, and they want to make sure that they're 100% confident that that site is going to support the, the level of traffic that they're going to get. And that would be a case where they would say, okay, you know, we definitely need to, to perform load, load testing and performance testing um, on this application before we launch it. So I've, I've had probably three or four instances over the past maybe seven or eight years where we've had customers that we really need to do load testing ahead of time because we knew that um, there were, were going to be spikes in the traffic that we wanted to make sure we could cover. Like, like I'm thinking one of example of a customer who is a nonprofit and they often have points in time during the year that they appear on like Fox shows on TV and things like that and they'll get in, um, immense spikes in traffic during a four to eight hour period and for the next six months their traffic is really low and we don't need to worry about it but it's that four or six hours that you know the CEO is on a Fox business show for 30 minutes and the traffic just goes through the roof. Yeah and you know that's a, that's a really great example of where you would want to do some load testing and coordinate with your host to determine if you need to uh, allocate additional resources to your to your site. Um, you know, because a lot of times you you know, like you said, throughout most of the year, you, you may be able to run at a certain uh, a certain set of resources for your for your website um, with your hosting, whether it be the amount of memory that's allocated, you know, what the load balancing situation is with your server configuration and all of that stuff. Um, and then you may be, like you said, anticipating a high traffic volume. Uh, the first step, I think, would be to notify your host and let them know, uh, you know, hey, hosting company, I'm, I'm expecting a, a pile of traffic that's way above what our norm is during this uh, this time frame. And you know, they may even have some uh, some recommendations for you on on what to do. Um, and step one might be, uh, if you haven't done it already, is to do some load testing with your current configuration. And then they may offer you some suggestions for some additional configurations or additional uh, resources or a backup server or whatever it might be. Um, and then you can perform that load testing again to, to make sure that you're going to uh, uh, be able to stay up during that time. So I'm, I'm interested that you brought up a few times uh, interacting with your hosting provider. So it is important that you have a relationship with the, the company that's providing the physical hardware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, it depends on what, who you're hosted with. Uh, you know, a few of the companies that we've worked with for hosting, uh, like Rackspace or Acquia, um, we've had kind of a relationship with for a long time, um, and we all uh, are in uh, strict communication when we're uh, preparing to launch a new project, so we're all on the same page. And um, we don't want to, you know, under-order or over-order uh, um, hosting services, um, because obviously that's going to be a bad thing both for the site performance and for... Uh, the bottom dollar for our clients. We don't want to have them overpaying for hosting that they don't need. Um, so it's really important to, to discuss with your hosting provider what your, your historic uh, traffic rates are like, um, what the kind of load or the overhead of your application is, depending on what sort of custom code or uh, integration that you have with, uh, with other third-party services, just so you have the full picture of, uh, of what's happening with your application. Um, and, and you know those those folks with the hosting company are going to be the experts with what what hardware you're going to need for your site, um, and they'll be able to give you some really good sound recommendations. So a load a load test, which is the the title of this episode today, is is a test that you do. It's very specific that is going to stress the website, uh, hopefully in a testing environment, um, to see what. Uh, to see what kind of the throughput that the, the website can handle. 
Yeah. Um, so, so before we dig in too deep, I think the um, you know there's a key kind of thing that we need to define, which is the difference between you know, performance testing, load testing, and, and stress testing, um, mm-hmm. and, and they're they're very different things. So when you're load testing, what you're trying to do is is just get a a baseline of how your site is going to perform with a certain amount of traffic. Um, so we'll say how many um, concurrent users are are hitting your site or your application. So think of think of concurrent users as you know human beings sitting down at a computer, actually you know uh, traversing your website. Okay, um, you you may have some traffic reports through like Google Analytics that can tell you how many folks are hitting uh, your site over a certain uh, period of time, and you can use that to uh, to calculate how many concurrent users is appropriate for you to test for. Because you don't want to spin up, you know, a load testing environment and just start throwing hundreds of thousands of users at your site because it's, it may not be representative of your actual traffic, and, and that's really the key thing is to test against what your realistic traffic is for your website or your application. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's a little, um, I think that people don't necessarily always understand what concurrent users is. So, um, a hundred concurrent users is a lot of concurrent users. Um, and when we say concurrent, we're meaning at the same exact moment they're hitting the website. Um, yeah. And that, that's a rare occurrence. Yeah, I think for most sites that is. Um, you know, I'd say 90% of the projects that I've worked on over the past 10 years, 100 users concurrently would be a pile of traffic, right? That'd be, yeah, right. That, that'd be a lot. So, so can, can, can we sort of define what, it's, it's hard to say what an, <laughs> what the average concurrent users is. Is there a way to approach this and say, like, let's just say for a regular website, th- this this is hard to do, right? Uh, <laughs> so for a regular website, for stuff that we generally launch, so John and Nick, you know, just chime in here. Um, you generally don't think about uh, stress testing or load testing on a website that you just generally launch. How many concurrent users does that just a general configuration support. I, I, I get that, that that's a hard thing to answer here, but... You mean... Yeah. So, Drupal starts having... I, it, it depends on whether it's a logged-in user or mm-hmm. an anonymous user. And, I mean, it, it's a vast difference. I mean, by default, Drupal can handle no problem... I don't know, a uh, uh, hundred or two hundred anonymous okay. users hitting a page if you have caching on. Um, it also you, depends on your. It also depends on your server configuration. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's a big it, part of it. it. Depends so much on that that it's almost <laughs> it, it's difficult to really make that prediction. But lo- in logged in users, I mean, it, it starts to have trouble around thirty or forty. I found. Um, Concurrent with, users. With, with your typical Set configuration up, yeah. for startup, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, we, you you really can't really say that because it also depends <laughs> on you know how many how much how big the site is, what kinds of how many views you have. I mean, it's it's tough to say. <laughs> yeah. I know it's tough to say, but I knew you'd try to answer it. Nick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's just so many variables to it. That, that's that's one of the key things about load testing. It makes it really important to to at least try out and 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 get familiar with. Is every site's going to be different? How many content types you have? How large it is? What hardware it's sitting on? Um, it, there's just a lot of things at play. Rob, is that something like Google Analytics even tracks? Is like concurrent users, or is that something where like you know the real time view for for what it's worth would could could potentially be helpful? Uh, well, the the real the real time analytics uh, is super helpful. It tells you how many like active users are on your site at any given time, and I'm not really sure the level of accuracy there. But um, you know, it does kind of give you some insight into. Yeah, I see Nick with his th- <laughs> thumbs down over there. Uh, it, it's okay, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's uh, you know something that you should I don't know, depend on for for anything mission critical. I mean, the, maybe we should talk really quickly about how you determine determine that level. The way the way I typically determine what level to test at is I look at the last month, two months, a year, you know, or so of the site, break it down hourly, and look at when their peak hours are, and then I take 
Um, I usually look for the highest hour that they had in the last year and then just divide that by the number of seconds in an hour and determine how many users that site got per second or how many page hits that site got per second during their peak in that year. And it's it's really not as, I mean, you need to have over 3,600 page views in an hour in order to really hit more than one concurrent user per second for that hour. And it's, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what, um, what you guys consider concurrent users, if it's the exact same second or within a five second window, but I mean, you, you're, you're looking at a fair level of traffic before you're getting even 10 or 20 concurrent users at a given, given second. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, what we're really, I think what we're really saying here is it has to be a very popular website in order to get a large amount of concurrent users to hit a website in the same exact second. Um, or, you know, you have to be selling something that everybody wants. So I, th I think that's, you know, kind of what it boils down to is, is like, how do you, you know, how do you gauge your popularity like that? So early on in a in a project let's let's talk about maybe a new a new site you're building for someone or someone's going to be doing something new or what are the key points things you're listening for as a developer that would clue you in to say you know what we should be adding load testing into this project plan are there some key things that you would be hearing from someone that would say to you you know this should be a deliverable as as a part of this project I think you know your your use cases, how how the client envisions a site being used, um, you know, and, and again, pop popularity. You know, if you know, if if the client can tell you, oh well, you know, this site's going to get, you know, five thousand hits a day, and you know, a thousand of those hits are going to be logged in users. And of course, I'm just kind of pulling stuff out of the out of the air, but you know. If you know you're doing a high volume of, of traffic per day, you know it, it may be worth going down that road. Yeah, I think I think that um, generally, like John said, if you get more than a thousand users that are logged in per day, that's definitely something you will look at. I'd say if if most of your traffic is anonymous, I start thinking about load testing. A little bit above 100,000 page views a month, um, depending on you know how variable the traffic is. I mean, if it's a site where their low their low month is 100,000, but they'll they'll have a good month and they'll get four or five hundred thousand page views in that month, um, and most of that's compressed in a day or two, then I'll 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 definitely consider um, load testing that site. And and the thing is, you can you can have different levels of load testing as well. I mean, you don't have to. It's not like the the second you decide to do load testing, it, it's this massive, ginormous project. It can just be, you know, well, you occasionally get this amount of traffic, so we'll run one or two runs, see how the server responds. And if it's okay, then it's fine. It also could be, you know, you're running, you run 20 tests at different times of the day with different traffic profiles, and then analyze, you know, how the server responds to each of those, tweak a bunch of stuff, run them again. Um, it really depends on traffic profile, name brand, size of the company, whether it's social or not. We actually we actually out. had a client who was um, making a big announcement uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and as part of the updates to their website, I suggested load testing because the announcement that they were making was so big that their website, it was a good possibility that their website was going to get a lot of traffic. And we really had no idea what the breaking point was. Um, so you know, we, uh, the suggestion was let's let's load test, do a little bit of load testing just to figure out where the breaking point is. And if we need to move, you know, if that breaking point is unacceptable, we need to, um, you know, we'll we'll make improvements to to move those numbers up. Yeah, I, I think what you're describing, John, is, is more of like stress testing, though, right? So. When, when we try to define the difference between stress testing and load testing, load testing is you're, you're just getting like a baseline metric, but stress testing is you want to push that server, that hardware to, to its limit and find out what it is. That way, 
you can anticipate, you know, hey, we're going to get, I don't know, uh, a half a million people on the site this month. We've never had that sort of traffic before. Um, we need to simulate that ahead of time and see if the server can handle it. That way we can proactively make a change to, to that hosting environment. So, so y you would define that stress testing is, is an ex exploration into finding out what you can handle with the current configuration and then the stress test to be how far can you push that configuration. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes you'll hear, um, you, you know, the, the, the words endurance testing kind of thrown out there too, and, and that's a similar thing. Um, it's not necessarily stress testing, but what you're doing is you're running a load test for a longer than normal duration of time um, just to make sure that the server can handle that as well. So there's kind of those three areas of performance or load testing that can, that can take place. So I sort of bring it back to users, you would say load testing would be finding maybe the highest level of general traffic that they get, running a simulation on that, seeing how it responds. Stress testing would be multiplying that by 10 and, or, or incrementally increasing that until the server breaks mm -hmm. so you know what level it breaks. And then endurance testing is doing the load testing just for a very long period of time to see if maybe there's a memory leak or something that incrementally increases and then you'll cause a break at a lower level if you end up with a sustained traffic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, so, so the only thing we didn't define is performance testing. So the slight difference there, right, is how does a website perform at any level at any, at any of those points in time? Yeah, and I think that's a, that's an important thing that I think is a side effect of doing the load testing is you can find out how different pieces of your application uh, are performing. So, for instance, if you were to run a, um, a load test scenario where you're only hitting your home page or you're, you're only hitting this specific set of pages on your site, it's not necessarily representative of the performance of your application as a whole. Uh, an example would be, uh, how does your user registration or your user login screen perform when, um, you know, many, many people are trying to perform that action at the same time. Um, or if there's a, a search page on your site, you know, what's it like when everybody is searching um, for, for content on your site? How do those pieces of your site perform? Um, and load testing should definitely reveal those things, provided that you've written a really, uh, a really uh, good load test script or, or a test case scenario. So that, that takes us as a great lead into the next topic here, which is what is a good strategy for doing this? You, you mentioned a test script. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. What, what is a strategy for someone who knows they need this? How should they approach this problem? Um, I, I think Nick brought it up uh, earlier on, just looking at that, um, at that client's um, analytics to see what their traffic patterns are like, um, what what people are doing on that site. If if uh, folks are uh, traveling from one page to another in a, in a pretty common pattern, or if most of the traffic is going to only one page, or um, and John brought up anonymous versus authenticated users, all those things kind of factor in. Um, but the, the key thing that you're trying to get the big picture of is, you know, how are people using this site, or how are they going to use this site based on, um, you know. Your, your content strategy, your UX design, all that sort of stuff. Like, what, what is the experience that most people are going to have? Um, and let's test for that. Um, and, and, you know, you would define, uh, for example, okay, we're, we're driving traffic through, let's say, an email marketing effort um, to a specific page on the site, and we're expecting that on that page we're going to have people that are, are, are going to be uh, registering on the site for a new account, and then naturally they're going to be logged in. Um, and then they're going to be brought to a page that only logged in users can see. That would be an example test script. So let's define a test script where they hit those different pages and perform those actions. Um, that would be one example. So yeah, and, and, and good software allows you to set that up so that it comes in a, a stream. Like you have, um, you have that workflow that you set up and then you have maybe hundred users just do it and then 20 and then 50 and then you know as time goes on because people when you send an email blast out people you know, a lot of people open it immediately and then there's a tail um, towards the end end of the day of people checking their emails yeah I, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit here um, in terms of what are we trying to get to through the 
test script and through the through the load testing process, what are we trying to get to at the end? Are we trying to understand um, what the server can handle and how we need to make changes? What, what are we actually trying to solve as we go through this process? Um, yeah, I, I think um, those might be something that are that are either defined by uh, your your testing team, or what, what things you're typically testing for, or it could be defined by your client based on some SLAs that they have with you. So, you know, an example would be we want the page to load in under X amount of seconds based on this traffic load. Um, or it could be, you know, let's see how this one particular feature that we haven't rolled out performs under our standard traffic. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the requirements around what it is that your end goal is uh, will, will be one of those types of things. So I would imagine early in the process you're sitting and defining goals with the customer is to say that, you know, based on maybe this campaign you have coming up or the general use of your website or this viral campaign you're trying to initiate that we would like to achieve these goals? Yeah, yeah, I mean, those things would, uh, for, for the case of like a, um, you know, a campaign or a new project uh, that, that you're um, still in discovery for, working out the contract details, um, those types of questions would be great to have come up. Um, you know, say, okay, what you know, what is the historical traffic on your site look like, um, and w what are you expecting from us as your development team? Um, you know, what would what what is going to satisfy the end user? What what type of experience should they be expecting? Um, you know, in terms of performance on the site, are they going to be unhappy if the site takes ten seconds to load, or is this the type of application where that's the norm? Um, you know, is there a threshold that you want us to stay uh, uh, ahead of, or or <coughs> Or that sort of thing. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the process here. So, what are the steps for someone to start to put together a load test process? What are the first things they should do? Um, well, uh, Nick, I'm not sure what um, what load testing tools you've used in the past. Um, the ones that, that we've worked with have been um, Blitz.io and BlazeMeter. Um, John, I think you had used uh, uh, Blitz.io for the project that you were referring to earlier on. Yeah. Um, sure. And your, your experience with that tool was, was quite a bit different than the experience that I had with, uh, with BlazeMeter when we were working on those projects around the same time. Um, so, I mean, what, what was it like for you, John, when you were working with, uh, with Blitz.io? Uh, so we were doing kind of a lower level of, of, you know, load testing. Again, we were doing more of a, of a stress test to see, like, where's that? Where's our breaking point? Um, so I, I actually found Blitz.io to be pretty, pretty useful. Um, you had the ability to set up um, a bunch of different tests, uh, different loads, different um, numbers of concurrent users, um, that sort of thing. You also had the opportunity to, to bring them in for, uh, from different locations, um, and that was one of the things that was important to our client was, all right, how is this going to perform, you know, if people in the U.S. are hitting it, people in the U.K. are hitting it, um, so on and so forth. Um, and you also had the ability to, you know, go through different pages and, and stuff like that. So uh, the, the real-time stats on basically watching your test were pretty cool, too. They have uh, this cool graph that shows you basically, okay, here's, here, are the, here are the ramp up. There's one user, two user, three user, and it's ramping up, and you can see at what point your site just kind of bombs out and people start getting errors and page, you know, page uh, server uh, response errors and stuff like that. So I, I, you know, for for what we were using it for, um, I thought it was great. Um, the um, project that Rob used BlazeMeter for, um, I, I don't know if Blitz.io would have would have been the best tool for the job, just because it was uh, uh, we needed we needed more. Um, we basically just needed more more flexibility in the types of tests that we were running and more information back from from the website. Yeah. So I, I don't think we're going to try to compare and contrast products today, but you've you've all you just brought up two products here. So we got Blitz, and then the other one was uh, Blaze Meter. Blaze Meter. So what are the basic differences when you're looking at products to help you out with with these testing? 
Uh, with these two in particular, there were um, two offerings that were recommended by the host that we were working with at the time. Um, and we, we just straight up asked them. We said, hey, you know, which one of these tools is going to be better for this particular um, test case that we need to run based on the requirements of the project? Um, and for that case, BlazeMeter was the right one for, for my project, and I think that Blitz.io was the right one for John's project. Um, the test script that I had to, had to work on for, uh, with BlazeMeter was, was very involved. It was very, very specific, and um, it had uh, you know, these kind of sets of pages that needed to, be, um, needed to be requested by both logged in and logged out users. Um, and, and you know when you're doing things like submitting forms, you need to be able to define all the form values and, and those types of things. And one of the things that we found in particular was that these tests are not fast to run. So when you're when you're trying to uh, maintain a certain threshold of response time from a server over the period of an hour, well, there's going to be two things that are going to happen. You're going to set up a test and it's going to just exceed all thresholds immediately. In other words, you try to ramp up too many users at one time, and your test is just going to bring the server down. Um, and that's going to happen quickly, or you're going to need to wait it out and run that test for an hour, um, and then you're going to need to make some changes to the test script, um, to the configuration for the test, and then you're going to have to run it again. So um, with BlazeMeter, what we did uh, is we were using a tool called JMeter, which is a, an Apache uh, project, and um, the, uh, the JMeter application, you can run locally on your machine, provided that you have Java installed, because it's a Java application. Um, you can set up your test scripts to find all of the criteria around uh, all of the things that you're trying to test for and all the routines and how many users that you want to perform those actions. Um, and then you can export that, that file and upload it to BlazeMeter, and then BlazeMeter will run that test for you. So it, it's pretty cool because you can run some of that stuff locally in very, very short tests, not a representation of the, of the actual test, but just to kind of fine-tune your routine, you know, your test script, um, and then push it up to, to BlazeMeter and actually run the real thing. Uh, and that saved us a lot of time because these things just take forever sometimes. I've got a really good sort of a question here, just an offside question. Did they authenticate you in some way to be able to run a test against a website? Like, because yeah, I, could, I, could, I yeah. could potentially use this tool to basically attack a website, right? Yeah, both options... Um, I know Blitz.io and I'm, I'm fairly certain uh, BlazeMeter do um, DNS authentication. So they, it kind of works the same way uh, Google Analytics does where <clears throat> you drop a meta tag into your site or you put a uh, text, yeah. text record into yeah. your DNS and it verifies that that's there before it allows you to uh, run any of these tests. Um, another point uh, in, in choosing a tool... Um, not only the two tools that we're talking about is uh, price point. Um, you know, the the Blitz I/O price point was kind of like pay per test. Um, so you got uh, you, you were able to buy um, a certain amount of of they have a it's name credits. for it. I, I don't know credits. if it's credits, tokens, yes, they call it credits. machines, whatever. Um, but you can buy a certain amount of credits, and you have those credits in your account, and you you use them as you run tests. Some some tests take five, some tests take two, ten, whatever. Um, but I believe BlazeMeter is a monthly or yearly um, billing cycle. Is that right, Rob? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah. a monthly service. Yep. Well, Blitz.io, you also have to have a monthly subscription. You can purchase. They have different levels that give you different amounts of credits per month and then if you need more you can purchase more but there's there's no way to just set up an account purchase a bunch of to uh, credits and, and run a test you have to have a monthly subscription there as well um, in order to, to get started so and I think you get disc you get more credits per month the higher the subscription and, and you get a bigger discount on additional Credits as well, or something. I feel like they had an option where you could just buy credits as opposed to as opposed to the monthly service, but they, maybe, they, maybe they did. Maybe, yeah, maybe I, they I did away with that. I'm curious to know what your ex what your experience was setting up the test scripts. So I assume there's some sort of interactive tool where you're going to walk through the website uh, under some scenario. You're logging in under a certain user. You're clicking things, recording the steps that you're taking. Is, is that how this works? Uh, there, there's a couple uh, browser extensions for Chrome that you can use. Uh, I think that 
that um, Blitz.io has one. I know that BlazeMeter does, and, and we definitely used that at one point. Um, but yeah, you download the, the Chrome extension, and then you can hit the record button, and you just walk through the site as any user. Um, and then at the end, you hit stop recording, export it, and it's, it's essentially a JMeter script file. Um, and you may or may not need to make some tweaks to that in order to use it for an actual test. Um, in our case, we definitely had to make some changes to it. Um, but we just loaded it up within the JMeter application, tweaked the test a little bit, um, changed some of the request values, but it did capture a lot of uh, a lot of really important information that we needed for submitting forms and things like that. That you know would have required a lot of manual work to to get, such as you know the Drupal form IDs. We know that every uh, every form on a Drupal site has a unique ID, um, and, and those things uh, need to be captured in order to submit those forms. Otherwise, Drupal won't allow it. So I'm looking at Blaze Meter right now. They have a developer level, which is allows someone to get started with this. It's free. Mm -hmm. um, gives you a test for uh, 50 concurrent users. But I can see it's only 10 tests per month, which, boy, that doesn't seem like a lot to me if I'm going to just try this out and figure out how it works. And yeah. The, and the first tier of pricing is $250 a month after that. Right, yeah, and you know, one thing that wasn't clear to me, <laughs> it's kind of a gripe that I have with, with that service, is that um, the documentation wasn't clear, but there's actually like a sandbox testing uh, sort of environment or account level, um, and if you don't run tests for over, I think it was like over 20 minutes or something, it doesn't count against your credits, so um, we were able to kind of fine tune and, and work on our test scripts without actually incurring uh, you know, any credit usage during that time. So. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I mean, it, it, it seems to me I could run this 50 times until I sort of have my test script right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you, you'll definitely need to. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Is BlazeMeter owned by New Relic, or, or are they just partners? Is it, the interface looks similar. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Um. So we've spoken about uh, BlazeMeter and Blitz. I just wanted to mention a couple other things that I've used um, that are pretty helpful uh, when running these. One is, I just mentioned New Relic. New Relic isn't so much the load testing piece, but it's uh, invaluable in the um, seeing how the server is responding uh, side of it. New Relic has some pretty cool integrations with Drupal as well, so you can see you know, how particular views queries are running, you can see what's causing trouble, what's going slower, um, what's going faster, and it's a good way to kind of help diagnose what specifically is causing problems if you're doing a stress test or a load test and you're having problems. Um, another, um, you had also mentioned JMeter, which is an Apache um, project. There's another Apache project called Apache Bench, uh, which is uh, pretty helpful. I I believe you can configure it to test external uh, URLs, but it's something you want to be very, very careful with. Uh, one reason to use Blitz or BlazeMeter is you're not going to get dinged as a, you know, a threat. I mean, they're they're set up so that when you're setting that off, you know, your host isn't going to shut you off for DDoSing the server. Um, if you're just using your own Apache bench script, that's that's a possibility. But you can use it locally to the server uh, in order to simulate um, concurrent users hitting specific pages. Um, I, I don't know if you can set it to submit forms or stuff. I, I generally use it just for anonymous traffic testing. Um, but I find that it's pretty helpful um, in just getting an overall idea how the server is going to um, respond and it doesn't have it, it kind of takes out the networking piece of it so you're not seeing any latency or anything you're just immediately hitting the server with however many users at a time as you want um, and it you know and it you can even do it to use things like um, searches as well if you're if you're testing something like that because typically with Drupal is a URL based search so you can tell it to hit those uh, hit those URLs and you can see how the site performs if people are hitting variable searches um, concurrently as well. You know, it's it's funny, like, I'm thinking back, it's probably 10 or 12 years ago the first time I did any kind of load testing, and back then there weren't services like this available 
that were easy to find. So what we did was we, we purchased a Windows-based software application that could allow you on a Windows machine to spin up a number of concurrent sessions going to a website with a script, and we would set up like five people in different areas and say, at 9 o'clock at night, we're all going to get online and we're going to do this at the same time. <laughs> And it, it really was an interesting way at that point in time to do some stress testing, and it worked. It worked very well. I mean, but uh, this this stuff has come a long way with with having services that are available for you uh, to do it for you at this point. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. I wonder if that company is still in, in business that sells that application. Yeah. I was, I was trying to find it here as we were talking, the Windows app that we used. I, I, can't, I can't remember what it was, and I actually can't find it anymore. So it's probably gone, but it was it was the big product at the time. All right, so um, what, what else should we know about stress testing? What, what things have we not covered in this 45 minutes of talking about this? Any other tips and tricks? Yeah, I, I think uh, Nick just mentioned in passing there about getting getting blocked for DDoS attacks when you're doing yeah. testing. I am guilty of that. I have definitely been blocked. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, you probably want to just give your hosting company a, a heads up like, you know, 48 hours ahead of time or something just to let them know you're going to be doing that because... Um, you know, but, 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 you know, hosting company does not probably like if you're using one of these bigger companies, they don't already have arrangements with them that they understand. IP well, address coming in from them is not DDoS attacks. I, I, that surprises me. Yeah, I'm not sure that all of these services have a, a a finite list of IP addresses. I'm sure they probably have ranges. And, and as John mentioned earlier, you know, you do have the option to perform your load testing from different locations. So um, it's basically a drop down. You say, you know, what, what server farm do I want to uh, send out all these requests from? And, um, you know, it can be somewhere overseas. It can be in the U.S. It can be from wherever they, they offer it. Um, and, and, you know, I think, <laughs> you, you know, most of those requests are going to come from the same IP address. And, uh, you know, most of the automatic monitoring software that these hosting companies are running is going to detect that and, and flag it. Um, so, yeah, I don't think that they, they have a set list of, of whitelisted IPs that they just say, all right, any traffic from there, that's okay. Um, and depending, on, depending on your hosting company, when, when something like that happens, you know, they, depending on the level of site, alarms go off and people get woken up. And so it's just nice to, nice to say, hey, we're going to be doing this, so don't, you know, don't freak out. So the process go getting unbanned? For DDoS, and was it just a quick conversation with uh, the hosting company, and or is it more involved? Is it more like getting off the email spam lists, or I'm, no. I'm not too familiar with that. Yeah, it, it was really quick. Basically, the the monitoring software they had running um, detected it, blocked all the requests from that IP address. They didn't take the site offline or anything. It was it was still up, but we just needed okay. to, you know, alert them and say, hey guys, really sorry that we didn't let you know we we're going to be doing that. We had no idea you were going to block us, but we're kind of happy that you did because now we know that yet, you know, you have a really good monitoring system in place that's going to catch that stuff. So, very good. So if you're trying to test your host to see if they'll block a DDoS attack, don't tell them you're doing load testing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I would, I, 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 sorry, I was going to say, one of the, the original question was, you know, what kinds of things to keep in mind. I mean, it's very important that you don't just, as we mentioned in the beginning, that you don't just decide to throw a bunch of users at the website. I mean, you have to get an accurate profile of how people interact with your website and scale that up. Um, to just give you a very quick um, example, a, a website that I was using with Apache Bench, um, I set up um, and I did some testing before optimization and caching and varnish and I did some testing after. And I would do um, 10 concurrent users, uh, 5,000 users, Apache Benchmark locally, and it would take... Mm, 10, 15 seconds to run. I mean, the site wouldn't go down. You could see a big spike in CPU usage and RAM usage. Nothing but no problems. Um, I turned on varnish, turned on you know caching, that kind of stuff, and I was able to send 
500 concurrent users, 300,000 hits, and it would complete in less than five seconds um, it, without any spike in CPU usage whatsoever. So, I mean, if you, if you have good caching in place, you can sometimes get inappropriate results if your users are generally hitting pages that either aren't cached or hitting pages that um, weren't in the cache um, until they hit them. Uh, and if you get a broad range of users hitting 10, 15 pages that have not been in the cache, you're going to see a very different result than if those same 15 people just hit the home page. Um, and you can get very, very skewed results. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, actually, is um, you mentioned Varnish Cache, and, and one project that I was testing um, did have Varnish in front of it uh, for anonymous users, and, you know, you're essentially not hitting the web server at that point. You're hitting the caching layer. So, right. yeah, it's not at all representative of how your application is performing. It's, it's really a representation of how your caching layer is performing, serving static content. Uh, yeah. So you definitely want to be aware of that. Yeah, so Nick, you you said that it didn't hit the CPU at all. It didn't hit the CPU on the web server, but it did hit yeah. the CPU on the Varnish server. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it was it was so much faster that I mean, Varnish specs that it can hit three thousand concurrent users per second if it's in the cache, and I mean, I certainly saw that. I think I hit twenty nine hundred or so. Right. So I mean it's it's certainly um, it's certainly something to keep in mind. So s setting up setting up one of these low tests, um, I'm assuming we're we're talking about not doing it in your production environment. M maybe you guys are, but um, <laughs> based on Nick giggling, he probably was. But uh, no, no, no. what what is the best way to approach this? In terms of a, what do you, you set up a du a duplicate development environment that's exactly like your production that you're trying to strive for? Isn't uh, that, that's, that seems like it would be difficult to do. I, ideally, it's the production environment before you've launched. So okay. it's the environment that will be production when it's production. Yeah. Um, but if in the event that you're you have a company site and you're adding new features to a dev branch. And ideally, your dev branch is as close to production already, and I, I would be running it against that. I don't, I don't know about you guys. I, yeah, I would never run load tests against a live site. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely way easier to do this stuff before you launch because you can do it in that exact environment that you're using for production. Post-launch, it's a lot harder. And, and one thing that I've found is that the, um, the development or staging environments that you're, that you're used to using may not be... Um, you know, they may not be the exact same hardware, the same exact configuration, whether it be the actual server, you know, itself, or load balancers that are in front of it, or caching configuration, or you know, another one that, that people forget about too is, you know, are you serving your pages over SSL in production, and are you testing the same way in your development environment? Um, all that stuff can can make the results of your testing different. Um, so yeah, there, there's a there's a challenge there to have those things in place, and there's also an added cost because if you need if you have this really robust uh, production server, and you know you're doing your testing either locally or you, and then you move it up to some other environment that's a uh, similar platform to your production environment. Uh, a lot of times, it, you know, it would cost you a lot of money to have that same exact production configuration just for the purposes of testing. Yeah, I mean that, that that's a great point, and I've seen I've seen estimates that SSL adds between fifteen and thirty percent. You know. Right. It, added load to servers um, and that can just be a few pages being served over SSL that are being hit versus the entire site so I mean there's you, you need to be on something that's a clone of production as close as possible in order to give valuable results yeah that, that's the point there is you need to be as close as the exact environment that you're delivering this in all right. Any, anything else anyone wants to bring up with load testing before we move on to our module of the week? Everyone shaking their head no. Okay, so let's move on to capture after. John, I think you posted this today. Talk about it. I did. So <clears throat> clients uh, came to us uh, a couple of days ago and said they wanted to add capture and recapture to their website. Um, 
but they wanted it to only be triggered after the user had um, either uh, failed to enter the appropriate information into the form um, or had uh, hit uh, a form a bunch of times. Um, I think they wanted five or ten times. Uh, but CAPTCHA doesn't allow for that. Basically, CAPTCHA it, out of the box is on or off. Um, there's no, hey, I'd like CAPTCHA to challenge this user after, you know, after they mess this up five times or after they mess this up ten times. So I what, think, John, I think that's a feature of Malum, right? Um, it, Malum kind of does it differently. It, it, Malum looks at a bunch of different um, metrics. They don't just look at the, the user kind of not right. entering information correctly. They look at patterns and how the user's using the site and that sort of thing. Yep. Um, this is strictly like, hey, I filled this form out wrong five times, um, so I might be trying to yeah. brute force it. Uh, so basically what Capture After does is it enables that functionality for you. It gives you the ability to say, I want this CAPTCHA to show up on this form after they've failed um, five times or ten times or, you know, however many times you want. And, and a fail means, like, required fields kind of thing? Um, yeah, so it can mean, you know, if they were trying to brute force the um, login form um, and they tried to log in five times and they got five, you know, they, they were unable to do it, uh, unsuccessful to uh, do it. Um, could be a web form, too. So if they fill out a web form and say they just put randomness in the email address um, and they do that five, ten, however many times you set, um, at that point it would give them a CAPTCHA to say, hey, are you a real are you a real person or are you a machine? Um, you know, it, it, overall, CAPTCHA isn't going to prevent 100% of spam, but, you know, this, this method is going to help you um, deter a little bit a little bit more than the average, I would say. Hey, Nick, I'm going to bring you in here. So in the last week's uh, episode, we talked a little bit about some issues you were having with a website that was related to the same kind of thing, people filling out forms and was crashing the site or creating too much traffic on the site. Does, does this module help for that scenario at all? I, I don't think so because we, we've got, you know, I, I, I got to look into it further because we've got an issue where we have we have Malum on the user registration form but users are still, spam users are still successfully creating and logging into accounts. So an email authentication is turned on. So I mean, they have to verify their email address. Um, so 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 we have we have a user registration page, yep. and the user is successfully registering through a bot. The user is successfully it, completing a captcha. Yeah, yeah. Creating and, an and account. Then, and then authenticating their account. Yeah, creating an account, responding to an email address, or rather, clicking on the right. link to verify it. And then logging into the website. So I don't know if something has changed recently because um, I've not seen this before. Um, do, do you I guys, thought, do you, you other guys, have any thoughts on that? I mean, I mean, so so someone there's a bot that's registering on a website, filling out the capture, then getting the response and responding to it via email, and it's all supposedly a bot related thing. Well, what I you know when I said that it would cover it would cover most of the spam that you're getting. A lot of times, spammy type companies hire real people to, to enter in their spam. So, you know, if it's a bot, maybe it's a really smart bot. Smart, smart bot. Wow, try saying that five times fast. When you live um, in Rhode Island. <laughs> seriously. It dropped my R's. Um, or it could be a real person. I mean, that's that's the other, other thing. You know, if it's a real person, they're isn't a lot you're going to be able to do to prevent against that. Yep. I don't I think it's a real person at the rate these are coming in, right, Nick? Yeah, I, I don't think so either. And I thought that there was maybe an unprotected um, form with the registration module, but, I mean, it, it. I just, I've tested it and it doesn't create an account there either. So, I mean, we do have commerce, and commerce does automatically create new accounts when people go through the checkout process, but we're not seeing fake orders showing up either. So, I mean, it's it's something that um, 
I need to I need to explore further. And we don't need to continue talking about it today. So, all right. I just was linking the two. So, great. So, um, let's close out today's show. And let's start by uh, thanking Rob for joining us today. Yeah, it was great to be on, guys. Thanks. I definitely had a lot of fun today. So, Rob, if, if someone wanted to reach out to you or to Oomph, where should they do that? And because this, this show is based on load testing, do you guys do load testing as a general service at Oomph, or are you doing it just for the customers and the projects that you're working on? Um, you, you know, that's a great question. We actually had a project recently where um, uh, the client came to us primarily for low and performance testing because they were having site issues. So, um, you know, it's definitely something that we can offer as a standalone service. Um, so, so if you have a website uh, that is not performing well and you need some help, reaching out to uh, John or Rob here would be a, a good step forward, right? Yep, that's right. And you can find us at, uh, at umphinc.com. And how about you specifically? Uh, my email address is rob at umphinc.com. So it's pretty easy to reach me too. Are you a Twitter guy? Yep. Um, not super active on Twitter. Now and again, I kind of have spurts of activity. Um, but you can, you can find me at ra8 on, uh, on Twitter. All right, great. Thanks for joining us today, Rob. You got it. And John? Uh, you can find me at John Picozzi on all the uh, major social networks. And as Rob said, boomfink.com. Awesome. And we, I'm looking forward to visiting the new offices in the next month. We're looking forward to having you. Great. Can't wait to see what kind of um, beverages and food you guys will be supplying. <laughs> Could, could be bring your own. Okay. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> you have, you have uh, a really you, big fridge for you to put your lunch in. All right, great. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can find me online pretty much everywhere at Nixvan, N-I-C-X-V-A-N. Uh, feel free to reach out any questions about load testing or you know setups that we have used in the past. And uh, see you guys next week. Awesome, great. I'm Stephen Cross, at Stephen Cross with a PH, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Take care. See. Have a good one, guys.